there interwebs, I hope you're all doing well. So I want to address a criticism from people of my last video I did in this channel called the Intrification of Leftist Discourse that I think is entirely valid and necessary for me to address and admit my uh, culpability in perpetuating in terms of the more moderate, even arguably centrist take that I presented in that video. While I still stand by the main point of that video that I was trying to get to when I decided to make it, which is the fact that uh, social media platforms like Twitter, which is the most obvious example, though certainly not limited to Twitter, as they get further and further into inshitification via capitalism and monetize every aspect of their platform, also have the uh, offshoot but also kind of intentional effect of generating more and more conflicts and giving rise to more and more division points within communities and across conversations. That was the overall point that I was trying to get to in that video. But the problem is, is kind of in two ways that I kind of started to angle towards towards the end of the video, but in a very unspecific way. And as a result, created a very problematic framing for the video that I think people were right to call me out on because it gave me a very centrist stance that I don't want to actually take. And that is to point out how those lines of division are generated in the first place. Because the lines of division that social media platforms are sort of exacerbating and building upon do not come out of nowhere, but are actual fractional division points within leftist spaces that are themselves built upon reinforcing the status quo, not just within leftist communities, but within the hegemonic, imperialist, colonialist, white supremacist, etc. at all American Western culture. To hone in on the specific example that most people were rightfully talking about, let's talk about the uh, leftist need to work out discourse that was going on over the weekend. The reason that there was so much discourse about that original tweet was because a lot of the subtext of that tweet, as well as the more literal text of some of the uh, people like talking about that tweet, was based in eugenics. Eugenicist ideals of, uh, you know, bodies having to be a certain way, valuing certain bodies, mostly being uh, not valuing disabled people, not valuing fat people. And I think the best way to kind of explain this point is to read a comment left by my friend and fellow creator, uh, the fat culture critic that she put on my original video and I would also recommend you going checking out her entire uh, larger video that she made over on her channel about this subject specifically. You're not wrong, but there is a problem of disabled, fat, and other marginalized bodied people being asked to always forgive and put aside our anger for the greater good or larger cause or whatever, to prioritize solidarity over everything. But solidarity with whom? With people who think our lives are shameful and worthless? Disabled people didn't get angry because the lift for the left person didn't include us. We read the dog whistles. This is an entirely correct point that I did not make and I actually will just say I fucked up on because the way I presented it in the video made it seem like everyone had equal points and all of it was just equal and it was just people arguing because our specific points weren't centered. And frankly, that is a point that other uh, creators have made as well and I think it is very problematic. I saw other people just saying, oh, just because a tweet isn't about you doesn't mean that you need to get angry about it. And while I do think that is the case in some aspects where someone makes a tweet about something specific and another person's like, well, you didn't talk about my experience and so that uh, therefore I'm gonna get angry at you. And I think that that does happen when people have combative readings of something rather than you know restorative readings of something. In this case, in this discourse, and in a lot of other discourses, what Sara is talking about is absolutely fucking true. That people who are often more marginalized within uh, our culture today are asked to stand in solidarity when someone is actively making um, statements that are harmful to the community that you are talking about. I mean, I know trans people experience this all the fucking time. I know I use this example a lot, but it is one that is uh, very personal in terms of how I was attacked for it uh, by JK Rowling herself. So apologies for me overusing this example, but take for example, the Hogwarts legacy de the whole debacle where trans people were pointing out like this uh, game hurts us in numerous ways. It hurts us by just making us feel unsafe in, in a community where you're playing a Harry Potter game. It also funds a transphobe, all that stuff. And people were saying, well, you should just let us have it. This is, this is, you need to stand in solidarity with us. This is something that you just need to be quiet about and just take, take it. It's not that big a deal. And while this situation with this stable tweet is much more overtly based in eugenics bullshit nonsense, uh, the, the same sort of principle applies in the sense that like the marginalized person in that conversation is being asked to stand in solidarity with people who are clearly showing that they don't give a shit 
about others' voices. And this happens across so many aspects of not our society, but specifically within leftist spaces. I see so fucking often, so often, for example, uh, black voices being drowned out in favor of uplifting the white voices on a topic. This is something that I want to talk about in a larger video, and, 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 I, and I, I, I want to be very careful with how I frame this. You know what, actually, I'll save that for another day because that one's going to be very, um, very touchy for other people. You can guess what I was going to talk about, but uh, I'll save that for a larger video where I'm more personal in my words. Let me use an older example. Let's talk about the absolute horrific murder of Matthew Shepard, for example. Matthew Shepard was a gay kid who was brutally murdered uh, in a suburban area uh, for being gay. And it was an absolutely horrific hate crime. And it was a violent hate crime that showed many people in America that yes, gay people were being attacked and harmed and, and violently killed and led directly to uh, you know, legislation for uh, protecting gay people. But what happened to Matthew Shepard, while absolutely horrific, and, and, and I'm, I'm not glad that his death happened, obviously, but glad that like his death spurned action what happened to him happened to, and still happens to, so many black, brown, indigenous, and other LGBTQ people of color in America all the time that never gets talked about. And when people do try to talk about the violence that is consistently being enacted against these, these communities, they're talked over. They're not seen as important, and they're not discussed. And when something like Matthew Shepard does happen, it's only discussed in the context of how it happens to white kids that, you know, our larger hegemonic culture actually gives a shit about. And that's not to say what happened to Matthew Shepard should have been ignored. I'm glad it was paid attention to, but the amount of attention that he got should have been paid attention to, to every single LGBTQ kid and really every kid who was murdered um, in that horrific way. And they weren't. And it's emblematic of how marginalized voices, even in, even especially in leftist spaces, and are often always, always, always asked to acquiesce in solidarity of the larger group when getting nothing in return. I mean, look at the LGBTQ community and see how, you know, marriage equality rights were fought for by many trans people, especially many BIPOC trans people, and then see how some gay white men, not all, in fact, I wouldn't even say most, but a portion of gay uh, white men went on to just be like, oh, right, we got ours, and, you know, now the trans people are asking for too much. You know, your log cabin Republicans, um, or hell, fuck, you, even your, your James Summertons, who would steal the words of marginalized folks and then proclaim them as own while adding his own misogyny and, like, weird, like, centering as gay men as the, like, sole and main victims of all queer phobia. And again, that's not saying all gay men or most gay men, just some who would just say, like, got ours, done. And all of this showcases how even within leftist spaces, which are supposed to be about trying to fight for an egalitarian society beyond hierarchies, that you still will see this uh, implicit assumption of the hierarchies that our society itself builds upon and presents as natural, that people do not investigate and thus replicate even within spaces that are trying to uh, supposedly be explicitly about breaking them down. Which is why, you know, I, again, I would go recommend Sarah's video on this topic. She makes a great point about how when we talk about the left, we do need to start defining our terms much more. Andrewism made a wonderful video as well a few years ago about why these divisions within the left are not inconsequential. And people will constantly frame it as like, the left's always infighting with each other, when I don't think that that's actually true. What the left should be doing is finding those fault lines and actually work to have conversations across them, not trying to widen them. And where I define my term on the, of the left, and I think you can get more specific than this, but the where I define my terms of where the left is versus like, you know, without saying names, the dirtbag left uh, sort of folks or, or, you know, other communities is like, where are people having fault lines across these divisions and where are they working to be like, oh, you know, I have a fucking bias and let me try and have a conversation across that and try to build that. And another thing is that I will also see, even more tellingly, people say that, you know, these divisions are psyops by, you know, the right wing to, uh, you know, cause division within leftist communities. But you know how psyops actually work? Psyops don't just generate issues out of nowhere. 
PSYOPs like that work by actually finding pre-existing lines of division and just drawing them out and exacerbating them further and further and further. I mean, look at something like the Russian disinformation campaign in the uh, 2016 and 2020, I believe also the 2020 elections, where they would do division points between, you know, Democrats and Republicans and, and stoke that division. That division already existed. They just exacerbated it. And so when people sort of say, oh, it's a PSYOP, you know, this is something that we, we shouldn't listen to, uh, what you're trying to do is dismiss your, uh, your responsibility to actually go out and listen to the people whose voices you are overriding. Uh, and, you know, the PSYOP wouldn't work if you just listened. But you just toss it off as like, oh, this is something we can dismiss because it's some weird psyop from 4chan or whatever, which is also dubious if that actually happens. But like, but like, even if it did happen, the point to make is that like, it's not that you should dismiss this. It's that you should listen to the people who are trying to earnestly have a conversation. Not the bot trying to, you know, stoke divisions. Which is, again, going to the point of why social media platforms are fucking shit. Especially right now. And again, I, I know I oversay this, but I think it's important to repeat because our society tends to view people as like perfect beings until proven otherwise and then they're the worst, is to say, I am not perfect, no creator is perfect, and we're all going to make those fucking mistakes. And what our society wants us to do is to make those mistakes and then because we have, if you're a creator like me, have a platform or have a job that you need to hold on to or some level of investment in you know the culture writ large that you, euphoria will be taken away from you if you acknowledge any sort of like mistake that you made, you double down on the mistake and say, no, I can't be wrong and, and align with the hierarchy instead of actually doing what you should do and say, you know, I fucked up. Let's, let's have this conversation. And, you know, there are also bad actors who are willing to use any admittance of like, oh, I made a mistake to then be like, aha, see, they're the, they're the fucking worst and we need to tear them all down. It's this complicated mixture of bad actors and our society trying to make you align with the status quo uh, by like saying, oh, well, if you, if you say anything, you'll lose your power, you lose your place in society, you lose your job, you lose whatever. And this is kind of the point that getting back to the point that I was making in my other video, you're seeing a lot in with social media, but you're seeing so much in our society, which I think is leading to I think in the past year especially, so many people I think feeling more and more disillusioned because these fault lines are getting more and more exacerbated. Our division points are getting more and more exacerbated specifically because we are in a society right now where th some things are like fascism are continually rising. And what fascism does is it continually tries to divide, 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 divide in us versus them. And it's easy to f point at like the fascist, you know, Republicans in power and see how they're doing it. But we also need to be very, very conscious of how we do it in our communities as well, because leftist communities are not immune to that. And the questions we need to ask ourselves are, how do we, how do we actually try to break down those us versus them mentalities and try to have conversations across those divisions? And number two, acknowledging, and this is the very important point, and again, the point that I fucked up not making in my first video, looking to whose voice is often not heard, who is marginalized, and who we are telling uh, in our larger hegemonic discussions to just shut up and, and not be listened to because you need to stand in solidarity. We need to hold together as the left. I mean, God, it just sounds like a Joe Biden Democrat, right? But we're doing it. We do it ourselves. The Democrats like, oh, the left is always the one causing division, but you need to vote for us or else you're, 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 you're going to get Trump. But we do it in our leftist spaces too. It's like, you need to shut up, you know, fat person. Don't talk about the eugenics dog whistles that you see in, in you know, these statements uh, because we need to actually hold the line against whatever fault line that you want to consider. And so I want to end this video with uh, an apology to those that, you know, I, I did not center in the video um, that I made last. While I, while I stand by my intention uh, to talk about, like, how social media is exacerbating these fault lines, by not actually framing the discussion in terms of like these power hierarchies that are that these are fault lines are built upon, um, I, I I erased an actual necessary conversation that disabled folks and fat folks um, were were having and and really needed to be heard in, um, and I and I and I deeply apologize for that. That is on me. Um, and I hope this video at least gives some voice to some of the things that you wanted heard. But again, I would heavily, heavily point you all to Sarah's video, which I think was fantastic in, in being raw and emotional, vulnerable, and yet very on point with these discussions. Um, so thank you for listening to me. Go listen to Sarah. Subscribe to her channel. 
because she's fucking amazing and one of the sweetest human beings that I know. Um, and Sara, if you are watching this, um, I want to apologize to you specifically because I love you and I adore you very much.